Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> welcome to the conference on the Allied Powers response to the Holocaust. I am Alexander Groff, Emeritus Professor of Political Science at the University of California, Davis, member of the Editorial Advisory Board of the Israel Journal of Foreign Affairs, and a former inmate of the Warsaw Ghetto, recalling part of 1940, all of 1941, and most of 1942, spent inside the walls of the Warsaw Ghetto, and with some very difficult times and years to follow. Our co-host here, is Tony Tankey, longtime distinguished member of the California Bar, former staff attorney to the Chief Justice of the State of California, and currently distinguished scholar and lecturer at Santa Clara University's Law School. It is a great honor and a special opportunity to hold this conference in the great city of Jerusalem, the foremost place of Jewish memory in all the world. It is also a special opportunity because 70 years after the Holocaust, in this, our contemporary world, the question of Jewish survival is once again very much at issue. The injunction, quote, never again, unquote, is being severely challenged, perhaps from some new sources, by some new technologies, but it is challenged nevertheless. How will the world respond to this new challenge? It is clear that we must not forget how it did and did not only some 70 years earlier. It is especially appropriate that we are meeting in a place commemorating one of the great champions of the Jewish people in all its long history, Menachem Begin. Before proceeding any further, I would like to express personal appreciation to the institutions and the persons who have done so much to bring this conference about. So I want to thank the World Jewish Congress. I want to thank the Menachem Begin Heritage Center, the Israel Council on Foreign Relations, and the In Faith Community Foundation. And also for the enormous personal effort and assistance, I want to thank Tony and Beth Tankey. I want to thank Dr. Lawrence Weinbaum chief editor of the Israel Journal of Foreign Affairs. And I want to thank Moshe Fuchsman, Deputy Director General of the Begin Center. I also want to thank Mr. Herzl Makov, President of the Begin Center. Yvette Schumacher, Managing Editor of the Israel Journal of Foreign Affairs. Many thanks to you. And Rachel Rizbi Ratz, coordinator of the Begin Heritage Foundation who has been very, very helpful to us. As one of the last remaining delegates from the Warsaw Ghetto, which is what I am, it is all but an unbelievable honor for me, an unbelievable pleasure, to be here in this auditorium with all of you, our distinguished guests and participants. And at this juncture, I would like to invite my dear friend and colleague, co-host Tony Tankey, for the purpose of some introductions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome to everyone, and, and thank you so much for, for hosting us here in this great state of Israel. It is my pleasure to introduce now for some greetings 
Dan Meridor, who is the president of the Israel Council on Foreign Relations, one of our sponsors. Mr. Meridor has had a distinguished career in the public life of the State of Israel. He has served as Minister of Justice, Minister of Finance, Minister of Intelligence and Atomic Energy, and Minister with our portfolio, as well as the Deputy Prime Minister of Israel, President Meridor. Good evening. Uh, I am here not as a minister, a former minister, but may I say, one of many disciples of Menachem Begin, and whose, for whose heritage this institution was uh, built and functions very successfully. I'm very happy that uh, the Council of Foreign Relations, the World Jewish Congress, and Menachem Begin Center uh, got their act together to bring about this conference. What a huge, dramatic revolution the Jewish people went through. We sit here in the center of Jerusalem in a strong state of Israel. And it is hard to imagine for people like me, who were born two years after Auschwitz stopped functioning, the plight, the lack of any force, the total failure, of the Jews in Europe, what they uh, saw around them, what happened all our life. We live with that. And it is still hard to imagine and understand. Now, years after that, the question of what could have been done, by whom, who understood in time, who did not understand in time, is a theoretical question, can never be proven, because history had its course, and you never know what would have been the alternative. But the question must be asked. If there was one time in history where the Jews were left totally alone, in the worst possible conditions, where everybody knew what is going to happen, everybody could know what was going to happen, and nobody, or almost nobody, did anything, is the lesson that we live with all our life. I must say that the question is put here about the Allied powers, the questions of bombing Auschwitz or the, the railways to Auschwitz. The questions have been raised within the Jewish leadership here and abroad. When things were understood, what was done, what could have been done. If you read the papers in Israel, in the land of Israel, in Palestine in those days, 43, 44, you would amazed to see that the Holocaust is not there. It was happening in Europe. So the questions are very deep. They go deeper than one can think of now. But research of the truth is of great importance. We need to know. We need to learn. And uh, I wish this conference successful days of, of discussions, hopefully hearing uh, new evidence, new conclusions. Uh, the good thing is that we changed Jewish history. For so many generations, you could read the chapters of the Jewish book of history. They were quite sad. The new chapter is a chapter we don't read, we write. And writing it puts us in a place that the question of what do you do when you have no power is not anymore and will never be a question of our real life. Thank you, and success for the whole conference. We are privileged to have with us tonight as our keynote speaker, Dr. Rafael Medoff. Dr. Medoff is a master of email. He accepted his invitation to this conference, I think about 15 minutes after we sent it, returning it with an email that made a whole bunch of helpful suggestions as about how we were going to do things tonight and subsequently in the conference, which you'll notice, I think, will his impact on it. Dr. Medoff is the founding director of the David S. Wyman Institute for Holocaust Studies in Washington, D.C.
Some of you will recognize the name of David S. Weinman. Uh, in many ways, uh, David S. Weinman is the founder of this field. Although there were studies in the 1960s and some in the 1970s, David Weinman put it all together, and the institute that commemorates him, Dr. Medoff heads. The Wyman Institute is the only institution in the world devoted to the studying and teaching specifically about America's response to the Holocaust. Dr. Medoff is also the author of 15 books about the Holocaust, Zionism, and Jewish history. We are extremely pleased and privileged to have him speak with us tonight. I want to get one more introduction in before uh, Dr. Medoff gets here. Uh, where's Herzl Mekoff? Herzl? Herzl Mekoff, President Head of the Begin Center, and our host. As you noticed, everybody is uh, anxious to hear Dr. Medoff, so uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, we, uh, here in the Begin Center, we feel very privileged and very honored to host uh, this conference. And I would like to uh, uh, extend our appreciation to uh, Professor Groth and to you, uh, Tony, for uh, all the efforts and the initiation uh, and for choosing this uh, venue to be the place for this important conference. Um, I would like to share with you um, a short story which concerns the issue that we are dealing with in this conference. In the first uh, visit of uh, Menachem Begin to London after uh, Mrs. Thatcher was elected as uh, Prime Minister, he had lunch with her. Uh, Menachem Begin uh, liked very much to go to Britain. Every time he went to the state, he stopped in, uh, in London, he used to go to uh, uh, Prime Minister Callahan, uh, reported to him, uh, and that was the first time he met uh, Mrs. Thatcher, which supposedly uh, was supposed to be more close to him politically. But this lunch became very uh, difficult lunch, because uh, beside Mrs. Thatcher uh, was there Lord Carrington, who was the um, foreign minister, and he was very harsh uh, with Begin regarding the settlements. You know, the same story always. And Begin tried to explain the historical rights and the security issue. And uh, during the discussion, he told uh, Mrs. Thatcher, you know, it's not the first time that we are under existential threat. You remember in 1944 what our people asked in this building in Downing 10? And she immediately stopped his sentence and questioned and said, yes, I know what you are talking about, uh, to bomb Auschwitz. He said, no, we didn't want to bomb Auschwitz. We asked you to bomb the uh, uh, train to Auschwitz. And she said, Okay, it's the same thing, but we couldn't do it. And if I would sit in the same room in 44, I wouldn't do it because I wouldn't take any energy from our effort to uh, 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 regarding Germany to bomb Auschwitz. That was the last time that Menachem Begin met Mrs. Thatcher. He never paid another visit to uh, Downing 10 uh, until he uh, resigned. And um, I think that this uh, can tell you about the importance of the lesson of the 40s to the Jewish people. 
And I, if I can sum it in one sentence that Menachem Begin uh, wrote in uh, one of his book, he said, the lesson for the future is, if an enemy of the Jewish people declares that he wants to destroy them, do not mock him, do not doubt him, believe him, and then do whatever you can to prevent it. I, and I brought those two uh, stories, or one sentence and one story, uh, to tell you how much we feel the importance of this subject to be studied and to be learned for future generation. Thank you again, Tony. Thank you again, uh, Professor uh, Gross, or, oh, uh, up there. Uh, and uh, I wish everybody here to enjoy the conference. Thank you very much. So I promise you, we will examine that British argument in this conference. Dr. Medoff. Good evening, Erev Tov. Let me first add my personal thanks to our to our sponsors, to the Menachem Begin Heritage Center, to the World Jewish Congress, the Israel Council on Foreign Relations, and the In Faith Community Foundation for their support of this conference, and especially to professors Alex Groth and Tony Tankey for all their hard work in making this event possible. Now, I'm sure that when Alex and Tony picked March 16th, a year ago, picked March 16th as the date to open this conference, they assumed that tomorrow, that Tuesday, March 17th, would be a day like any other day. And then, lo and behold, the powers that be had other ideas and Israel's national elections were scheduled for the first day of our conference, and it was much too late to consider rescheduling, I'm sure. Despite the obvious disadvantage of having, they, I'm sure they assumed, having, the, having less focus, less spotlight on this event. I'm sure people said to Tony and Alex, um, you're going to be talking about American presidents and their attitudes towards the Jewish people or the Jewish state, and you know, who's going to be interested? And then, lo and behold, the last five weeks, the entire uh, Israeli election uh, has been overshadowed by, yes, a, a, a gigantic debate over the relationship between the American president and the Jewish people and the Jewish state. All of which just goes to show you, historians are still relevant. <laughs> History still matters. So Alex and Tony kind of had the last laugh here because suddenly this is really connected to everything that we're seeing going on around us here in Israel. Now in my remarks this evening, I'm gonna be focusing of course on a, a different president and his relationship to the Jewish people and to the idea of the Jewish state. Presidential decision making, and the shaping of a president's policies are of course a combination of both political and personal factors, which is to say that of course there are political, diplomatic, military circumstances that shape a president's decisions. There are personal factors as well. Inevitably, a president's personal inc inclinations, the way he was brought up, his personal beliefs, somehow affect or influence the positions that he ultimately takes when he enters the Oval Office. And it's, it's hard, of course, to measure to what extent a, a president's personal views 
influences policies, but I, I would say that it is impossible that a president's uh, personal attitudes have no effect. Part of the reason it's hard to measure in any particular situation, whether the president is acting out of strictly political and diplomatic uh, considerations or personal attitudes, part of the reason it's hard to measure that is because presidents don't always write things down. Now, some presidents fortunately have left a treasure trove of evidence for historians about their personal beliefs. Richard Nixon, happily for us, <laughs> taped all of those Oval Office conversations, and so we have a good idea today what he thought in his heart about Jews in addition to, to many other subjects. So that was, you know, that was helpful. Um, Harry Truman at times kept a diary. About 10 years ago, a, a handwritten diary that Truman had kept that nobody had known about because he had kept it in the back of an old ledger book. It turned up by accident in the, the Truman Presidential Library. And there we had, again, coincidentally, some rather harsh remarks about Jews, and again, other topics as well. But my point is that in the case of Nixon and in the case of Truman, we have a pretty good sense of what they were thinking privately. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, however, was a president who, generally speaking, did not commit his innermost thoughts to writing. And as a result, when we study how FDR responded to the Holocaust, or when we look at what were his views on the Palestine situation, what was his attitude towards Zionism, for the most part, we've had to rely on the correspondence of his advisors, memoirs and diaries of his cabinet members. Unfortunately, in those days, a number of his cabinet members did keep diaries. Henry Morgenthau, the Secretary of the Treasury, did. Vice President Henry Wallace did. Interior Secretary Harold Ickes did. Um, so those are, of course, important sources. And we have, obviously, the, doc the internal documentation, the documentation at the State Department. So we see what Roosevelt State Department people were thinking. But in terms of FDR himself, it's a, it's a harder a task to figure out what was in his heart and in his mind because he didn't keep a diary. But, but, in the last few years especially, there has been important new research which has uncovered new documents that do provide us with a revealing glimpse at President Roosevelt's private opinions concerning Jews, concerning Zionism, concerning the future of Palestine. The result, new controversies, of course, between historians and, and, and among the public as well as critics and defenders of President Roosevelt grapple with this new evidence. In my remarks, I'm going to refer and share with you uh, some of the, the new documents that have been found and take a look at what that tells us about President Roosevelt's attitudes towards the plight of the Jewish refugees, the Holocaust, Zionism, Jewish statehood. Let's begin with a little, a little bit about, about FDR's personal background. Grew up in a, what we might call an upper, upper class, higher society family in upstate New York. Wealthy, privileged. In his family, um, as one might say, in many families of that time, one finds a good deal of evidence of anti-Semitism. And just, and just to cite one example, let's, let's mention his mother, okay? And I mention his mother because he was particularly close to his mother and often cited his mother as an important influence on shaping his own worldview. So for example, in the case of his mother, Sarah Roosevelt, we have documents which show what are unquestionably anti-Semitic remarks. For example, FDR once wanted to have his gubernatorial campaign manager. So this is when he was running for governor of New York in 1928. This was campaign manager, Belle Moskowitz. He invited her over for lunch, and his mother objected, Sarah Roosevelt objected on the grounds that she said she did not want that fat Jewess in her home. Now, having anti-Semitic relatives obviously does not make you an anti-Semite. 
Um, and even though, as I say, the president was, the future president, was very close to his mother, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that he shared those views. Although one might also say at the same time, it would not be shocking, it should not be shocking to us if we know this about his mother and we know about anti-Semitic remarks made by other members of his close family, would not be entirely shocking if he shared some of that. Of course, there was a lot of anti-Semitism in American society in those days, 1920s and 1930s. Uh, but I think it's also important to note that there, was, there were many people who were not anti-Semitic. It's not as if American society was dominated by or permeated with anti-Semitism. There were many people who were decent people and who did not share such bigotry. Ultimately, the same basic moral principles, the same Judeo-Christian values, as we call them, that prevail today in America were still the basic values of America even back then. So I think it's important not to excuse what we're about to, what I'm about to share with you on the grounds that, well, there was a lot of that in those days, because you didn't have to be anti-Semitic. And it wasn't, um, it, it wasn't, it, it was not inevitable that one be anti-Semitic. One could choose to not be. Franklin Roosevelt's views on immigration in general offer, first of all, an important clue as to some of his views about Jews. And here I am indebted to the research <clears throat> about 10 years ago of Professor Greg Robinson of Montreal. Professor Robinson was studying Roosevelt's decision to intern many tens of thousands of Japanese Americans in detention camps during World War II without any, without any evidence that they were in fact disloyal. He was puzzled that a president who had um, risen, risen to the Oval Office with the reputation of, of being a humanitarian. His campaign slogan, one of his campaign slogans in 1932, his first presidential campaign, was that he would be the champion of the forgotten man. That was one of his slogans. So Professor Robinson was puzzled. How could somebody who professed to have such a basically liberal and humanitarian attitude, how could he do something so that we today recognize as being so outrageous, and many people at that time also considered to be outrageous. So he was looking at FDR's statements on immigration and foreigners in the 1920s, and he found a number of interesting, interesting remarks that I want to briefly share with you because they're going to reveal something significant about his attitudes towards Jews and Zionism. This is from an interview that FDR gave in 1920 when he was the Democratic nominee for vice president. Asked about immigration. He, he said that immigrants fail to conform to, and I'm quoting here, fail to conform to the manners and the customs and the requirements of their new home. The remedy for this, he said, should be the distribution of aliens to various parts of the country. He said, quote, the greater part of the foreign population of the city of New York, and obviously he had Jews in mind, certainly among others, the greater part of the foreign population of the city of New York should have been distributed to different localities upstate. So his, so his the thrust of his overall attitude towards these large numbers of, of immigrants who were coming <clears throat> was that they were problematic. They didn't easily assimilate or acculturate. And they should be spread out, physically spread out, so that they would be more, more likely to, be, uh, uh, to integrate into the general society. In the 1920s, Roosevelt wrote a number of articles for several publications. One was called Asia Magazine. Others were columns he wrote for a Georgian newspaper, the Macon Daily Telegraph, where he addressed the issue specifically of Asian immigration. This was a hot, a hot button topic in the 1920s. Should we be allowing um, Japanese in particular to immigrate to the US? Roosevelt wrote, and again, so we're talking about 1925. Okay, he's, not a, he's not in high school. He had already been a candidate for vice president, so he's a mature politician. <clears throat> He wrote in 1925, anyone who has traveled in the Far East knows that the mingling of Asiatic blood with European or American blood 
produces, in nine cases out of 10, the most unfortunate results. Or another column in which he talked about um, immigration of Europeans. And he said he, he would favor admitting some Europeans as long as they had what he called blood of the right sort. He said immigration should be restricted until the United States had time to digest, that's his word, digest those who had already been admitted. And he proposed that all future immigration should be limited to those who could be most quickly and easily assimilated, including by forcibly dispersing them around the country. So his overall view in the 1920s was that, was that foreigners in general, and here he's singling out um, Asians, didn't necessarily make very good Americans, that we shouldn't let too many of them in, and the ones who come in should be forced to spread out around the country. And when he talks about the mixing of Asian and white blood, what he's suggesting is that Asians, Japanese, had certain innate characteristics which would become problematic if they came in large numbers, or let's say if they concentrated in a particular area. And, that, and these same themes show up in the documents that have recently been discovered in which Roosevelt talks about Jewish immigrants, and Jews in America in particular. That's why I'm bringing in these references to the Asian immigration because his views on, on the Jews fit in with a broader view of foreigners and their place in American society. And we'll soon see how this connects to his views on Zionism and Palestine. So at the same time that he's talking, he's writing in the 1920s about the dangers of Asian immigrants, at that very same time as a member of the Board of Overseers of Harvard University, Roosevelt was one of those who initiated the quota on Jewish students. They limited Jewish students, and, and here's how he explained it later. And, 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 and the quotation is actually from 1941. It's a, it's a conversation in 1941 where Roosevelt's kind of boasting about how we at Harvard realized that, this, that the Jews were a problem. He said that the admission, their admission should be limited, quote, until it was down to 15%, because you can't get a disproportionate amount, amount of any one religion. This idea that if you have too many, if you have a disproportionate amount of Jews in any one profession or, or a university, this shows up again and again in the documents that have recent, recently been uncovered. One of these documents is a private conversation between the pres President Roosevelt and Rabbi Stephen S. Wise, the most prominent American Jewish leader of that era. It's from 1938. This is actually a document that I found um, at the Central Zionist Archives here in Jerusalem. It's Wise's account, it's Wise's account of his conversation with Roosevelt. Wise describes how, and it was not, of course, for publication. Wise was an ardent defender and supporter of FDR and of the New Deal and of the Democratic Party. And this was just a private memo that he, that he wrote down for his own files. He described how <clears throat> when he, Wise, began talking about the problem of Jews being mistreated in Poland, again, this is 1938, he said Roosevelt then said that the Polish economy was dominated by, quote, the Jewish grain dealer and the Jewish shoe dealer and the Jewish shopkeeper. And, FDR said, that, what was caught, what, that was what caused, quote, the Christian shopkeepers to demand that the Jew should go. So it's Jewish domination of the Polish economy, as he claimed, is the cause of anti-Semitism in Poland, in Roosevelt's view. <clears throat> we have a document from 1939. It's a private conversation between Roosevelt and a senator, uh, Burton Wheeler, who was a, um, a Midwest isolationist, but a Democrat who was a, an ally of FDR's. And they were having a conversation about possible presidential candidates in 1940. So this is before Roosevelt had decided or announced that he was going to run for re-election in 1940. And he and Wheeler are talking about who might run. And they started discussing whether or not Secretary of State Cordell Hull might be a viable candidate. And Wheeler pointed out, uh, Wheeler raised the, the, the issue that Hull's wife was um, partially Jewish. 
which is to say Hull's wife's father was a Jewish immigrant, but she was raised as a Christian. Uh, but Wheeler was aware of this, and that, so he raised it. Could this become a campaign issue? And Roosevelt agreed that, Hull, that this, would, this would be harmful to Hull's candidacy because it would come out that his wife was partially Jewish. And at that point, Roosevelt then begins talking about how you and I, Bert, he says to Senator Burton Wheeler, you and I, Bert, we know there is no Jewish blood in our veins, but some of these people don't know what they have in them. So again, we've got the disparaging kind of reference to Jewish blood. Again, going back to the idea that there's something innately different about Jews, just as he was talking about the differences among the Asians. We have an account of a 1941 cabinet meeting, and this account comes from Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau's diaries, in which the president had recently returned from a trip to the West Coast, and he made a disparaging remark about how they, there were too many Jews among federal employees in Oregon. Again, too many Jews concentrated in a particular area. That, in Roosevelt's mind, was a recipe for trouble. I'll mention, I'll mention just one more. There are, there are quite a few of these um, now, but I'll just mention one more because it's particularly significant. And this comes from the transcripts of the Casablanca Conference. January 1943, President Roosevelt and, and top aides meeting in North Africa, in Casablanca, with the um, French officials who were going to be the, um, the administrate, were going to be administering the allied, the, you know, the new allied government in recently liberated North Africa. In this conversation, again, it's a transcript, so it's, it, it's from a source which is really impeccable. They begin to, uh, a, a question is raised by the, by the French as to the status of Jews who were living in North Africa. There were over 300,000 Jews uh, in Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco. Um, what would be their status in the new, um, obviously on, under Arab rule, they had been second or third class citizens. What would be their status under, under the allies? The point was made that the Jews expected to have equal rights and be allowed to vote and so forth and be, be given full equality under the allies. Roosevelt responded that the Jews should not be allowed to, quote, overcrowd the professions. He said quotas should be established to make sure that there would not be too many Jews entering various professions there in North Africa. And I'm, I'm going to quote here. He said, this, having such quotas, would eliminate the specific and understandable, specific and understandable complaints which the Germans bore toward the Jews in Germany, namely that while they represented, while the Jews represented a small part of the population, over 50% of the lawyers, doctors, school teachers, college professors, et cetera, in Germany were Jews. Now, that number is a wild exaggeration, but the point is that the President of the United States believed that allowing, allowing Jews to, to, to enter those kinds of professions in large numbers would lead to trouble in society. And he, he used the word understandable. He could understand why in Germany there had been this, this vicious anti-Semitic reaction because allegedly the Jews were in all these professions out of proportion to their numbers in the general population. But now let's look at the other side. Let's, let's consider the other side of this equation. We know that Franklin Roosevelt had many Jewish friends. I mentioned Henry Morgenthau. Morgenthau was his neighbor um, in upstate New York. They'd known each other since long before FDR came to Washington. We would consider, I think, Felix Frankfurter to be a friend of the president. They had known each other from Harvard days, so he had Jewish friends. We know that he had many close Jewish political associates. I've mentioned Bell Moskowitz, his campaign manager in 1928. There were others. Samuel Rosenman was his chief speechwriter and senior advisor. Bernard Baruch was an advisor to President Roosevelt. David Niles was the president's liaison to, um, to ethnic uh, minorities. So there were a number of Jews in Roosevelt's circle. Also, of course, there were many young Jews who were among his appointees in implementing the New Deal. So you have here on the one hand a president who was perfectly willing to bring 
Jews into his administration, even a Jew in his cabinet, Morgan thought, Jews among his friends and associates. And yet at the same time, we have, we have indisputable documentation of the president making what can only be described as derogatory or disparaging remarks about Jews in private. So is there a contradiction then? There would seem to be. There would seem to be a contradiction between the FDR who disparaged Jews in private and the FDR who had Jewish friends and who, and who in addition had made some sympathetic remarks about Jewish development of Palestine. He didn't say a lot about Palestine in the 1930s. Um, it, certainly in the, in the early and mid-30s it was not an issue and it was not something his administration had to take a lot of interest in, but I should point out that in 1936, when the British were seriously considering imposing severe limitations on Jewish immigration, the limitations they would later impose as the White Paper in 1939, but they were planning on doing originally in 1936, and Stephen Wise went to Roosevelt privately when he heard that this was in the offing, and he asked the, and he asked the president to intervene, and he did, Roosevelt intervened in the autumn of 1936, shortly before the 1936 presidential election. He pressured the British to hold off. As a result, the white paper was not imposed for another three years. Something in the range of another 50,000 Jews reached Palestine during those three years. So again, on the one hand, you have the Roosevelt who helped in this particular instance regarding Palestine and who had all these Jews in his administration or in his inner circle. And then you have, the, you have the, the, the FDR saying all these nasty things about Jews in public. But I'm going to argue that, in fact, there's no contradiction. He had genuine personal feelings about Jewish blood, which he did not look at with admiration. He had um, a, a strong aversion to the idea of there being a lot of Jews in America or of them, of, of, of a lot of Jews being allowed into America or of them concentrating in particular cities or institutions. We mentioned Harvard. So on the one hand, that were, th those were his personal feelings. We can see that. But at the same time, a certain type of Jew could be useful. It would be useful in implementing the New Deal, <clears throat> serving his administration in various ways, serving his political campaigns. It cost him very little. There was very little political price to be paid to having, let's say, a Jewish campaign manager in his gubernatorial campaign in 1928, or having some of the Jewish advisors he had in his inner circle. It wasn't really, it was, it wasn't really much of a political risk. There was, of course, anti-Semites sneered at that, but, but still, overall, it was not, he didn't pay a price for that. So it didn't cost him a lot to have certain types of Jews in his administration. And the same thing may be said of the 1936 episode that I just mentioned. It didn't cost him very much to quietly turn to the, to the British government and say, you know what, don't, don't limit immigration to Palestine right now. It didn't cost very much, and it could be useful. It, it could... It could gain him Jewish votes, for example, in 1936. He couldn't be certain that he would have overwhel you know, the overwhelming level of, of Jewish electoral support that we now know he received, which was almost 90% in, in each of his re-election campaigns. But he didn't know that yet in September 1936. So there was something for him to gain politically by helping out in that one instance with Palestine, and very little cost. The question then becomes, how would he react when helping Jews had a price? And that brings us to the question of America's immigration quotas. And then it will bring us to the question of Palestine. The immigration quota system that was in place when Roosevelt became president was something he inherited. It was not his invention. It was something that, um, that Congress and the Hoover administration um, had enacted and implemented prior to FDR becoming president. So he inherited a, a, a system that was very restrictive in which 
limited immigration from various countries, especially from countries where, as it would happen, large numbers of Jews were trying to flee. But there's an important difference in the Hoover administration's immigration policy and that of the Roosevelt administration that I just want to mention very briefly here. <clears throat> because before we say, oh, well, it was Hoover's system, don't blame Roosevelt. The restrictive policy of the 1920s and then of the, of the Hoover years was enacted and implemented at a time when there was no mass persecution of Jews in Germany. It was before Hitler. There was no large body of Jews fleeing vicious persecution and needing a, needing a haven. So the Hoover administration was never tested. In other words, it, 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 it implemented a harsh immigration policy in response to the Great Depression, in response to the very real problem of high unemployment and economic stress in the United States. But there was no countervailing pressure. There was no body of people fleeing from religious oppression trying to find a home in America as so many had found a home in America in previous generations. So those noble principles upon which the United States of America was founded as a haven for the oppressed, the famous words on the Statue of Liberty, those were not tested in the Hoover years, but they were, of course, tested in the Roosevelt years because it was during the Roosevelt administration that the question of, uh, of, of Nazism and the persecution of Germany's Jews became a real issue. <clears throat> the State Department in those days, unlike today, the State Department was in charge of implementing immigration. But I, I stress the word implementation because the State Department did not make its own immigration policy. The State Department didn't make its own foreign policy at all, of course. The State Department implements the policies of the President. So what the State Department did in the area of immigration reflected what it understood the President wanted and, in fact, what the President told senior State Department officials he wanted. What it implemented was a, a system of not merely not merely admitting immigrants according to the immigration quotas, but deliberately suppressing immigration far below what the existing law allowed. And they accomplished that by burdening would-be immigrants with a virtual mountain of regulations and requirements that made it um, impossibly hard to qualify for a visa to the United States. <clears throat> And just to give you a sense of what the, what the forms looked like to apply for a visa to immigrate to the United States during that era, I'm going to show you a replica of the immigration form. That's one side. Here's the other. So you had to fill out, you had to fill out these kinds of forms in, in triplicate, by the way. You had to provide all sorts of guarantees, most notably a financial guarantee that someone in America would make sure that you would be financially secure if you couldn't find a job. It's not something that many German Jews could easily attain. You had to overcome all sorts of additional obstacles and requirements that were set up precisely for the purpose of discouraging immigration. And the result of was that in the 12 years that Franklin Roosevelt was president, in only one of those years was the German quota filled. The German quota, 25,957 German citizens could, in theory, immigrate to the U.S. in any, any given year. But the quota in only, only one of those 12 years was filled. And in most of those years, in the majority of those years, it was less than 25% filled. So the large majority of the immigration places allowed by law were never used. And they didn't roll over, by the way, to the next year. So if they weren't used in a given year, that was it. They were gone. If you add up all of the unused immigration places from Germany and then later from Axis-occupied countries from 1933 to 1945, it comes to over 190,000. So that's 190,000 Jews, 
who could have been admitted to the United States within the existing laws. <clears throat> when historians and others sometimes argue about what could Roosevelt have done to help the Jews, you will frequently hear it said that, of course, in Congress there was strong opposition to more immigration. And in general, among the American public, there was widespread opposition to immigration. So it is often said that while Roosevelt couldn't have done anything in the, in the face of such opposition, he couldn't have forced Congress to liberalize the immigration system. He couldn't have persuaded the public in the midst of a depression that, that there should be public support for immigration. That's the argument one often hears. But what I've just shown you is that 190,000 people could have been allowed in without going to Congress, without starting a public debate, without causing any controversy, without any kind of a public argument. All the president had to do was quietly tell the State Department, allow immigrants up until the existing maximum allowed by law. Just follow the law. That's all he had to do. How do we know that President Roosevelt knew that the State Department was suppressing immigration to such low levels? Among other things, we have a letter from the President himself to Governor Herbert Lehman of New York in 1935. Governor Lehman wrote to suggest a very modest increase in immigration. And the President, in his response, acknowledged that the visas, he, he said, had indeed been considerably under-issued in recent years. This is 1935, so he's referring to 33, 34, 35, when the quotas were 5, 10, 15 percent filled from Germany. And in this letter, he specifically mentioned the number of immigrants admitted. So the president knew that the quota, that the Jewish immigration was being suppressed, and this was the policy that his State Department therefore implemented. We also, by the way, have diary entries from Assistant Secretary of State Breckenridge Long discussing with the president um, immigration policies and briefing the president as he did regularly. Long regularly briefed the president on the methods that the State Department used to keep immigration at such low levels. Nonetheless, interestingly, despite the fact that these numbers are black and white and statements such as that the president made to laymen are in the president's you know, own words. Nonetheless, interestingly, the question of the levels of Jewish immigration is still sometimes a matter of debate or controversy today among historians. And I'll just mention an example because very recently there was a letter in the Journal of American History, one of the leading scholarly journals in the field, from Professor Richard Brightman of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, in which he argued that the low immigration figures were all Hoover's fault. And I'm going to quote from his letter. He said, the failure to fill the German quota during FDR's first term did not result from extra requirements and regulations that the Roosevelt administration piled on. Rather, and I'm still reading from his letter, rather it resulted from an executive decision by former President Herbert Hoover in 1930. Well, it didn't. It began with an executive decision by former president, by then President Herbert Hoover in 1930. But as we have seen, Roosevelt took that policy and made it worse by adding on all sorts of additional requirements. And I'm going to cite some examples now. And it's because of these additional requirements that, and I'll just give you an example here, let's compare immigration from Germany in Hoover's last year to Roosevelt's first. So immigra Jewish immigration from Germany in 1933, Roosevelt's first year, went down by more than 35% from the number that had been admitted in 1932, Hoover's last year. Now, the interesting thing about Professor Brightman, um, the position Professor Brightman has taken, is that in his earlier work, and now I'm referring to a book he wrote in 1987, a book, a book about, um, about America's immigration policy, during the 1930s, 1940s. He wrote there that Roosevelt's policy was based on, quote, intent of exclusion. He said then, 
that refugees were excluded by, quote, altering bureaucratic procedure. And he named a number of senior officials, and I'm going to quote again from his 1987 book, Assistant Secretary of State Wilbur Carr, George Master Smith, Breckenridge Long, the Commissioner of Immigration Daniel McCormick, and many other officials at lower levels of authority devised and carried out adjustments to immigration regulations that had a major effect upon the level of immigration to the United States. Why has Professor Brightman reversed his position since 1987? Why, in this letter to the Journal of American History and in his recent book, FDR and the Jews, does he argue that, uh, in fact, it wasn't Roosevelt's fault? Uh, the answer is I don't know, because he has chosen not to respond to questions that I and others have raised um, about the change in his position. But frankly, he had it right the first time. And, and examples abound um, about the regulations that were used, as he put it, for intent of exclusion by the Roosevelt administration. I'll just give you a couple of examples. One comes from the research of um, my colleague, Dr. Batami Zucker. Professor Zucker is at Bar Ilan University. She'll be speaking um, during this conference. She found a very interesting example of how the consular official, American consular officials in Europe um, excluded some immigrants. It has to do with the ketubah, the, the traditional Jewish um, religious marriage certificate. I would hazard a guess that President Roosevelt never saw a ketubah in his life. And yet, in his administration, a ketubah of all things ended up becoming one of these weapons of exclusion. How so? Immigrants, uh, would-be immigrants, applying for visas from American consuls in Germany, in some instances, would present their ketubah as evidence of their marriage. Now, why would they present a ketubah and not their civil certificate of marriage? Well, let's say, for example, they had been married in Russia. Let's say it was someone who had been married in Russia and now lived in Germany. Maybe they didn't have a civil marriage certificate. Maybe all they had was a ketubah. Um, or maybe an uncooperative German government official didn't feel like giving some Jewish, um, some Jewish uh, applicant a copy of his ketubah. So, they, so an applicant, we know from the documents, showed up with his ketubah. Consular officials would not, re re would not recognize it as being legitimate, as being evidence of marriage. And if the ketubah is not proof of marriage, that meant that the applicant's children were born out of wedlock which was evidence of low moral character and therefore a basis for rejecting the visa application. They would sometimes tell these, someone who brought a ketubah, go back to where you were married and get a copy of your marriage certificate. Well, can you imagine a Jew in Germany in 1935 trying to go back into the Soviet Union to get a copy of his marriage certificate? Let me cite an example from the research of uh, my colleague, Professor Stephen Norwood, who will also be speaking here in the conference. In his book, uh, The Third Reich in the Ivory Tower, he describes instances in which young Jewish refugees of college age who had reached England and had received scholarships to attend university in the United States, but were not given visas to go to the United States. Why? Because they could not prove that they had a permanent address to which they could return. A, you can see the kind of catch-22 here, by the way. So an address in Germany was considered not necessarily a legitimate return address because, because since the Jews are being persecuted there, maybe they won't really be able to return. But if they can't return, well, that's why they're asking to come to America. Let me share with you an example from, of all things, the New York Times entertainment section a few months ago. They had a feature on the 1930s Hollywood mogul, Carl Lemley. Carl Lemley himself was a, a Jewish immigrant from Germany, and during the 30s, he provided financial guarantees for a number of people from his town to also immigrate. But after a number of them had already received visas and were coming, the State Department stepped in and they blocked further, they, they blocked the, um, they rejected any further promises from him. Now again, he is, as I said, a Hollywood mogul, so he was a very wealthy man. Obviously, he was in a position to provide financial guarantees. But the State Department's rejection 
of his guarantees, and we have a letter from the State Department to Lamley, cited the fact that he was 71 years old as evidence that he might not live much longer, and therefore his financial guarantees might not be worth much. Here's an example from Professor Breitman's own book in 1987. He cites a case of a, a teenager, German-Jewish teenager, Hermann Kilsheimer, age 19. His sister was married to an American. So here's young Hermann going to the American, American consul in Germany, asking for a visa to join his sister and her American husband. The American husband and his brother had both provided financial guarantees to bring Hermann over. The consul rejected the application on the grounds that since he was about eight, the age that he might want to go to college, if he did go to college, his brother-in-law might not be able to afford to pay the tuition. The most infamous restriction, however, came in 1941. It was called, it was sort of nicknamed, the Close Relatives Edict. <clears throat> and this regulation um, imposed by the Roosevelt administration, by the State Department, automatically rejected an application from anybody who would still have close relatives left behind in Europe, which what meant quite a few Jews still had close relatives left behind in Europe. The theory was that if they had relatives left behind, the Germans might at some point take those relatives hostage and thereby compel the immigrant to become a Nazi spy. Needless to say, no cases of such forced espionage were ever found, but this was the basis for the close relatives prohibition. And so through all of these severe and blatantly unfair methods, the Roosevelt administration was able to reject the large majority of visa applicants and to keep immigration from Germany at um, remarkably low levels. Now, how does this tie in? How does this immigration policy tie into Roosevelt and Zionism, Roosevelt and Palestine? An important connecting thread comes in the person of Isaiah Bowman. Isaiah Bowman was known as Roosevelt's geographer. He is a, a figure from that period who has not received significant attention, except uh, in the work of our colleague, Professor Monty Penkower. And I would argue that Bowman was an extremely significant figure in shaping Roosevelt's attitudes towards Palestine and in kind of bringing together FDR's attitudes towards Jews in general and then his policies regarding Zionism and Palestine. Bowman had been the chief territorial advisor to President Wilson at Versailles. He had served as the director of the American Geographical Society. During the 30s and 40s, he was president of Johns Hopkins University. He was arguably the most prominent and respected American geographer of his time. He was also unquestionably anti-Semitic. And just to cite one of many quotes from, um, from Bowman, he once said, this is referring to Jews, Jewish students who were admitted to Johns Hopkins University, of which he was president. He said, quote, Jews don't come to Hopkins to make the world better or anything like that. They came for two things, to make money and to marry non-Jewish women. And so Bowman instituted a quota on Jews to Johns Hopkins. Um, and essentially, it, and the quota stemmed from the same motive as that which Franklin Roosevelt and his colleagues had implemented at Harvard, the idea that having too many Jews in, in the institution would somehow corrupt the culture and the, um, and the stature of that institution, of that university. Starting in 1938, FDR hired Bowman. He enlisted Bowman to carry out a number of geographical surveys, looking around the world to see if there were any havens for refugees, especially for Jewish refugees. Was there any, is there anywhere where we could put those Jews so that they wouldn't have to come there would be pressure for them to come to the United States. But every country that Bowman and his staff looked at, they found to be unsuitable for any large foreign immigrant group, as he called it. And in a memo to Roosevelt explaining why there was just no place where we could put them, he, said, he also addressed the question of 
possibly bringing them to the United States. And he said that if the, um, he said that the importation of European population elements um, would bring European quarrels into America. The better idea, Bowman told Roosevelt, would be to keep those European elements within the framework of the old world, keep them there. Bowman said to Roosevelt that Jews should be allowed into America only in limited numbers. He, he put it, limited numbers here, there, and elsewhere. He said the absorption must be on such a limited scale in any one area that the people already established in the area will welcome the new settlers. He warned about the danger of Jewish control. Again, you see the parallels in Bowman's perspective and some of the quotations from Roosevelt that I mentioned earlier. The danger of Jewish control if too many are allowed into the country, and particularly into the cities. He also warned the president that Jewish refugees admitted to regions in the Western Hemisphere, other than America, would be constantly looking around for escape, particularly to the United States. 1942, State Department established a special office of post-war planning. President Roosevelt appointed Bowman to be head of this new office, which gave him a base in the Library of Congress, a large staff, researchers, and they undertook a huge, even more comprehensive um, set of studies known as the M Project or Migration Project. And their task was to, to try to figure out where are we going to put all the refugees from, this, from the, the war. They compiled over 600 reports. The significance of these 600 reports is that they were distributed throughout the administration that Bowman, Bowman took part in policy discussions in the White House and the State Department. He became an important figure in, in shaping the policies of the Roosevelt administration. Bowman, no, no surprise, was bitterly opposed to Zionism. In one policy discussion, he said the Zionism was no different from Hitler's Lebensraum. Bowman's warnings to FDR about Arab opposition to Jewish immigration into the Middle East, by the way, helped sabotage a British proposal. This was in 1943. There was a British proposal to the US that maybe some European Jewish refugees could be temporarily settled in Libya, in allied liberated Libya. Bowman warned against it because he said it would stir up strong Arab opposition. <clears throat> and now we have an extremely significant quote from Roosevelt, which shows us, really illustrates <clears throat> how deeply influenced he was by Isaiah, Isaiah Bauman, or the extent to which their, their opinions um, coincided. This comes from the diary of Henry Wallace, the vice president. Wallace was describing in May 1943 a discussion that took place between Roosevelt and Churchill <clears throat> at the White House. At a, after, at a private luncheon in the White House. And they were talking about the post-war situation, and the question of the Jews came up, of what they like to call the Jewish question. That arose. And Roosevelt said to Churchill that he had been consulting with Isaiah Bowman on, quote, the best way to settle the Jewish question. And he, the president, had decided that the best way, as he put it, was, quote, essentially to spread the Jews thin all over the world. This is now, this is Wallace writing. The president said that he, FDR, had tried this out in Merriweather County, Georgia. And that's where Roosevelt lived in the 1920s when he was struggling with the onset of polio. That Roosevelt had tried this out in Merriweather County and at Hyde Park on the basis of adding four or five Jewish families at each place. He, Roosevelt, claimed that the local, Jew, the local population would have no objection if there were no more than that. So here you see the convergence of the Roosevelt's mindset and of Isaiah Bowman's mindset. Spread the Jews out thin. Don't allow too many of them into Harvard. Don't allow too many of them into the Polish economy. Don't allow too many into professions in Germany. And, and the same applies for Palestine. If you allow too many of them into Palestine, then the Arabs would object. So therefore, in Roosevelt's mind, the best way to deal with the Jewish question, spread them out thin all over the place. 
We see Roosevelt's Palestine policy uh, first beginning to emerge in early 1939 with the St. James Conference. St. James Conference was a last ditch attempt by the British to bring together Jew the Jewish leadership of Palestine and Arab leaders, ostensibly to try to come up with a solution to the Palestine problem. The British very much wanted Palestine on the back burner because of their anticipation of war with Germany. They didn't want that distraction. <clears throat> and so in early 1939, Palestine Jewish leaders, as well as some American Zionist leaders, met at the St. James Palace. Now, I remind you, we've seen what Roosevelt did on Palestine when there was no price to be paid. 1936, there was no price to be paid, and there he was helpful. So what happened in 1939 when, in fact, there would be a price? Jewish leaders, as they went to St. James, um, were deeply skeptical as to British intentions and as to what, what was likely to happen. In fact, in Stephen Wise's private correspondence, we find him writing that he expects the Jewish leaders are being, in his words, bamboozled, that the British were really setting things up for failure, um, and that the British were, in fact, inclined to take the Arab position. And sure enough, that's exactly how, how, as it, how it turned out, but we know that from a peculiar set of circumstances in which in the middle of these meetings, and by the way, these were not face-to-face -face meetings because the Arab leadership refused to meet face-to-face -face with the Zionist leaders. So these were sessions held in separate rooms, a kind of precursor to Henry Kissinger's shuttle diplomacy. But what happened is right smack in the middle of these discussions, a British clerk accidentally sent to Chaim Weizmann, president of the World Zionist Movement, leader of the Zionist delegation at St. James, sent to Weizmann a letter that the British had intended for the Arab leaders. And in that letter, it was clear that the British were intending to fully adopt the Arab position, to back off completely from establishing a Jewish national home, to severely restrict immigration, um, and that that had been their plan all along. And of course, when Weizmann saw that memo, um, at that point, the Zionist leaders announced that they would, take, take, they would no longer take part in any of the sessions of the St. James Conference. There were a few further private discussions on the side, but, but that was the turning point. They, it was clear then that they had, in fact, been bamboozled. The British were preparing for war, um, and, they, and they wanted the Arab world to stop causing trouble over Palestine. But now again, I, I, I bring us to a current controversy, um, and again, from the work of Professor Brightman, whose work is significant, and that's why I'm making reference to it again, and his new book, FDR and the Jews, and his, let us call, revisionist version of the St. James Conference. Reading Professor Brightman's book, one, one discovers that the British may have been pro-Arab at first, the beginning of the conference, but he says they tilted back to the Jews in the midst of the negotiations. He says that, um, that, there, that President Roosevelt had been secretly pressuring the British, quote, on behalf of Jews seeking refuge in Palestine. Now this is a remarkable statement since it is, of course, contrary to what we know from all previous histories of the St. James Conference. How is, it, how is it possible that a distinguished historian presents such a completely different view of Roosevelt and Palestine than all previous historians have described? Well, presumably, he has some new evidence that he has discovered. And yet, one, when one looks at the footnotes, one discovers that the source for this claim the claim that Roosevelt was secretly pressuring the British on behalf of the Jews. The source was, in fact, one of the members of the Arab delegation. And I don't have to tell you um, how unsurprising it is that a member of the Arab delegation in 1939 had a wild conspiracy theory that the Jews have somehow got President Roosevelt to pressure the British. A responsible historian does not take such a source 
seriously for this kind of purpose. One does not completely revise what happened at St. James based on a conspiracy theory by a member of the Arab delegation. President Roosevelt did not intervene in any way at St. James, um, nor did he intervene against the White Paper, which came a few months later. St. James was essentially a, way, a, a paving of the way for the infamous White Paper, which shut off this country to Jewish immigration, uh, to almost all Jewish immigration, all but a trickle, let us say, of Jewish immigration during the war years. St. James enabled the British to say, look, we tried, we brought them together. They couldn't come up with any kind of solution, so we'll just have to put everything on hold, close the doors, freeze the promise of a Jewish national home, and uh, too bad. Rumors of this impending white paper, by the way, were circulating well before the white paper was issued. It wasn't that everyone suddenly woke up one morning and heard that the white paper had been proclaimed. On the contrary. Prominent American Jews and American Zionist leaders knew of it weeks in advance, and they approached President Roosevelt. F Professor Felix Frankfurter, who by this time was already a member of the Supreme Court, but still a close confidant of FDR, asked the President to intervene. Roosevelt said no. Supreme Court Justice Brandeis also called the White House, asked the President to intervene against the impending white paper. Roosevelt said no. Brandeis then asked him, would, he, would the president at least give what he said, he, I'm quoting, he give a few minutes, a few minutes, to see one of the Zionist leaders just to hear their case. Roosevelt sent back, he jotted down on the, on the request that his secretary gave me, he wrote, can't see him. President Roosevelt did tell Secretary of State Hull that the white paper was, quote, something that we cannot give approval to. But at the same time, he told the US ambassador in England, Joseph Kennedy, to limit any criticism of the white paper to unofficial contacts with British officials. There should be no formal protest. The United States was not going to take part in any kind of public quarrel with the British um, on the eve of what appeared to be a war. Thus, from the British point of view, there were no consequences. There was no fear of American anger, unlike in 1936 when Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin had to deal with the fact that he had the President of the United States on the phone asking him, don't shut the doors. Here, he didn't have that. Here, the British saw no danger of, of, of problems with Washington over the white paper. In the years to follow, during the years of World War II, we see from the correspondence of American Zionist leaders <clears throat> growing evidence that President Roosevelt was becoming colder and colder towards Zionism. For example, in October 1941, there's a memo from Nahum Goldman, the Jewish Agency and, and, and Zionist Emergency Council's representative in Washington. There's a memo from Goldman to Zionist leaders in which he says, quote, there are reasons to believe that even in higher quarters, and now he's, we know from the context he's referring to the White House, even in higher quarters, there are certain prejudices that have to be overcome in order to get support <clears throat> for a Jewish Palestine. Also in 1941, we have a private letter from Rabbi Stephen Wise referring to Roosevelt as, quote, hopelessly and completely under the domination of the English Foreign Office and the Colonial Office. We know as well about Chaim Weitzman's meeting at the White House in July 1942 Weitzman wanted to speak with the president about Palestine, and FDR did something that he was very skilled at. He quickly diverted the conversation into a long discussion about something else. In this case, he got Weitzman into a long conversation about the production of synthetic rubber for the war effort. And he dragged that on for a good 10, 15 minutes, and then an aide came and said, I'm sorry, Mr. President, you know, uh, Dr. Weitzman's time is up. FDR was very good at doing that to keep, keep controversy at arm's length. In 1942, the president and his administration were so, so anxious to keep their distance from the idea of a Jewish Palestine 
that when the Palestine Symphony Orchestra, Palestine Jewish Symphony Orchestra, wrote to the White House to describe its intention to name its new amphitheater the Roosevelt Amphitheater, the White House forbade them from doing so. They didn't want Roosevelt's name on something that was so closely associated with the Zionist cause. One more, uh, and one very fresh example of the new research on Roosevelt and Palestine and Zionism. And this concerns the election year of 1944, when the Republican Party, for the first time, included a plank in its official platform calling for the rescue of Jews from Europe and the establishment of a Jewish state. This was a political achievement that was secured to a significant extent by young Ben Sion Netanyahu, leader of the revisionist Zionists in America, father of the Prime Minister, of today's Prime Minister, um, and also through the efforts of Rabbi Abba Hillel Silver, the co-chairman of the American Zionist movement, along with Stephen Wise. <clears throat> so they had secured from the Republicans this unprecedented, first ever, platform pledge on rescue and statehood. And as a result of that, Rabbi Wise and other prominent Jewish Democrats then went to the Democratic National Convention that summer and persuaded the Democrats to match it. And that's what we call good old fashioned American politics. Getting both parties to compete for the support of a particular constituency. But after, the, uh, platform, after these platforms were adopted, the American Zionist leaders, and I'm here talking about Wise and Silver and their colleagues, <clears throat> realized that what they really needed was one further step. They needed the president to specifically and publicly confirm that he supported that part of the democratic platform. And the, the, the reason, one of the compelling reasons that they felt that was so important was because they caught wind of the fact that the Republican presidential candidate that year, Governor Thomas Dewey of New York, was about to issue a statement endorsing the Republican plank on Palestine and rescue. <clears throat> so in late September and early October of 1944, and it's about a month or so before the elections, with Dewey's statement uh, in the offing, President Wise, uh, uh, Rabbi Wise and, um, and Rabbi Silver requested a meeting with President Roosevelt to ask him for such a statement. The White House um, then contacted Wise privately and told him they didn't want to see Silver. They regarded Silver as unfriendly because Silver had helped get the Republicans to endorse Palestine. So they wanted just Wise to come to the White House. And he did. Wise, Wise flew to Washington on October 11th for a private meeting with the President. And here's how, here's how Professor Breitman describes this episode in his recent book, FDR and the Jews. He says that Wise met with FDR in the White House and apparently gave the president a letter drafted by Senator Wagner. Senator Robert Wagner, Democrat of New York, was, uh, was up for re-election. And he was going to be speaking at the annual convention of the Zionist Organization of America the following week. And Senator Wagner and the Zionist leaders thought that this would be the appropriate way, the, opp the opportunity for President Roosevelt to personally affirm his support for Jewish statehood. So back to Professor Breitman. So Wise gave FDR a letter drafted by Wagner. Professor Bre Bre uh, Breitman writes, the draft, Wagner's draft, the draft is not in the president's files. Okay, it's not in the president's files. But if you're writing a book called FDR and the Jews, and you're looking at the president's files in Hyde Park, New York, and there's a key draft that's not in the file for whatever reason, do you stop there and then declare, sorry, the draft is not in the files as if the draft doesn't exist? Or do you look in some other archive and there are other obvious places where it might be, and try to find that draft. 
I'll return to that point in a moment. So Professor Brightman tells us that um, the Roosevelt looked at this, um, at the language about how the Jewish people have worked and prayed for the establishment of Palestine as a free and democratic Jewish commonwealth. I am convinced, this is where the statement read, I'm convinced that the American people give their support to this aim, and if reelected, I shall help to bring about its realization. Sitting up in his bedroom the night before the Zionist convention, so now you have, an, Professor Brightman is creating kind of an image here of, you know, Roosevelt is practically, I mean, he's bedridden, um, but he's sitting up in his bedroom, so determined to endorse Zionism, that he approves this strong declaration, which Wagner then read at the Zionist convention. Um, the Zionist delegates responded with a sustained standing ovation, and it seemed to be you know, a real moment of triumph, and clearly a declaration of FDR's strong support for, Palestine, for Jewish Palestine and Zionism. But what about that draft? And I ask about the draft because Professor Monty Penkauer did go look in another archive, and that's what a responsible historian does. And he went to the next obvious source, which is the Central Zionist Archives down the street. <clears throat> and lo and behold, there was the draft. Mystery is solved. And the interesting thing about the draft is that the draft is different from the statement that Roosevelt issued. It turns out, and I'm, now I'm quoting from Professor Penkower's book, Decision on Palestine Deferred. It turns out that FDR watered it down in, in, in several significant ways. In the original draft, Wagner had referred to an undivided Palestine. Roosevelt crossed out undivided. In the original draft, Roosevelt was pledging to do all in my power to bring about a Jewish homeland. He changed that to help. He watered that down to help. In the original draft, Roosevelt pledged that he would do this as soon as practicable. He x that out. So, the allegedly stalwart pro-Zionist Roosevelt of the Brightman book, in fact, was a Roosevelt who was not rising from his sickbed to, in, to help the Jews, but in fact a president who was looking at a draft that Professor Penkower found and watering it down because he did not want to be too, going too far, too committed to Jewish political aims. And let me add one more point, because I myself went over to the Zionist archives yesterday, and I took a look at the minutes of meetings of the American Zionist Emergency Council from October 1944. And this is what you do. You go and you look at, if you're a serious historian, you look at, go to the documents, see what the documents say. Don't be satisfied if, you know, if the document is missing from one archive or from one file. So I took a look at the minutes of the American Zionist Emergency Council. Here we have Abihalel Silver and other American Zionist leaders discussing among themselves Wise's meeting with Roosevelt, the drafts, and this whole process. Um, Silver, I should note, was rather upset. Um, Silver was not a stalwart Democrat. He was not a loyal Democrat as Wise was. And he was unhappy about Wise sort of putting the Jews in Roosevelt's hip pocket. And at the meeting, he complained specifically about a, a kind of a, a wisecrack that Rabbi Wise made to reporters when he came out of the White House at the meeting. He said that Wise had said, um, when he emerged from the meeting with the president, that he did not know for whom he would vote in November, whether for the president or for the Democratic candidate. Get it? <laughs> so, and Silver was upset. Silver said um, he was disturbed that Wise was giving the impression that the whole Zionist movement was tied to the Democratic Party, that it was inevitable the Jews would support the Democrats, because, not because Silver was a Republican. In fact, he was not actually a member of the Republican Party. And nor was Ben Sia Netanyahu. He was not a Republican. He was not a Democrat. He was a Zionist. From their perspective, um, if, it, if the president could assume that all Jews would vote for him, then he would have much less incentive to support um, Jewish requests or Jewish positions. But there's an important political element that I want to briefly mention also um, 
in Roosevelt's decision to give this message to Senator Wagner for the Zionist Convention. Because again, from Professor Brightman's account, there's no sense that there was any political motive involved. It sounds like Roosevelt is just a gung-ho Zionist. But I found something interesting um, in, at, over at the Zionist archives. I found a um, minutes of a Jewish agency executive meeting it was late September 1944, where Nahum Goldman is briefing David Ben-Gurion and the other Zionist leaders on the political situation in America. And Goldman, and Goldman says to, the, uh, to his Zionist colleagues that they're, they've decided to try to get some kind of a statement or a declaration from the president. And here's how Goldman describes the arguments that Wise was going to make to Roosevelt to convince him to, uh, to issue the statement. Here's what it says. Wise Ya'amar law, Shahat Sahara, Wise was going to say to him that the declaration, Kazot, that this kind of declaration, Yechola Lahavtiach law, 200,000 kolot. Okay? So why 200,000 kolot, Nusafim bin New York. So Goldman is, Goldman is saying that Wise intends to tell Roosevelt if he issues this Sahara, this declaration, it, could, it will gain for him 200,000 more votes in New York. October, Hanasi Yitze Ulai 200,000 votes in New York is no small matter. If you are running, against the Republican governor of New York in 1944. And we know from the internal documents of the Democratic Party leadership that they were by no, they by no means felt certain that FDR would re win re-election. And a governor of New York had the potential to win New York, which in those days had the largest number of electoral votes. It doesn't anymore, but it did then. So it was the most important prize in a presidential election. And the Jewish vote in New York, obviously, then as now could be a swing vote. So Wise is, is telling, Wise intended, and we, we're going to assume here for the moment that he probably said something to this effect to the president about these 200,000 votes. Now why am I saying that? You can't just assume he said it. Maybe Goldman and Wise were talking about it, but he didn't do it. No. Because when we look at, um, again, back to the minutes of the American Zionist uh, Emergency Council, after the statement was issued. <clears throat> we find uh, Herman Shulman, one of the um, leaders of the American Jewish Congress, describing to this session what Dr. Wise told him about the meeting with Roosevelt. <clears throat> and Wise said, according to Shulman, that there was no doubt that the political situation, that's what he called it, the political situation, was what had influenced the president to issue the statement. So Wise was telling his close colleague, it wasn't just that Roosevelt was some great, I mean, not at all, some great friend of Zionism, but he had a political calculation to make. Not issuing the declaration, not issuing a, you know, a statement endorsed in the Democratic Party platform meant possibly paying a price. And this brings us back to the theme that I've been returning to again and again. <clears throat> if there was a price to pay, then Roosevelt's true feelings, his personal feelings on Jews, Zionism, Palestine, would play more of a role. If there was no price to pay, as in 1936, no political price to pay, then he could, in his mind, afford to be more forthcoming or more generous. <clears throat> the record of uh, President Roosevelt on Zionism and Palestine um, during World War II <clears throat> is darkened by one other episode to which I will refer briefly. Um, and that is what is known as the Hoskins Plan. In late 1942, Roosevelt sent <clears throat> an American emissary, Lieutenant Colonel Harold Hoskins, to the Middle East to survey opinion in the Arab world, to consider the Palestine issue, and to come back and report to him and recommend what American and allied policy should be regarding Palestine during the war. Hoskins returned in 1943 with a better, very bitter report from, from the Zionist point of view. Um, 
He said that, I'm quoting, if the issues of a Jewish political state or a Jewish army continue to be pressed at this time, the Arabs would instigate a very bloody conflict that would drag America and the Allies into the fight over Palestine. The State Department, as a result, proposed that the President issue a ban, a ban on public discussion of Palestine for the duration of the war. State Department proposed it. The British agreed to it. The proposal was sent to Roosevelt's desk. He wrote in the margin, OK, FDR. Um, it didn't come about because Jewish leaders, including Jews in Roosevelt's inner circle, heard about it in time and actively intervened. And you might wonder, why did, why did someone like Henry Morgenthau, who was not a Zionist, or even better example, Samuel Rosamond, his chief speechwriter, who was certainly by no means a Zionist, I call him an anti-Zionist, why did they lobby against such a declaration, and the interest, such a ban? And it's an interesting kind of psychology that was at work. Rosenman warned the president that if he issued the ban, Jewish leaders, Zionist leaders, would ignore it. They would continue agitating for Palestine, and that would cause anti-Semitism throughout the United States. So Rosenman was against it kind of for a backwards reason. But, um, but here, when again, when there was a price to pay, when you had his Jewish advisors pleading with him not to issue the ban, when you had American Jewish leaders like Stephen Wise and others warning against it, and then when you had congressmen hearing about it, most notably Emanuel Seller, and making speeches from the floor of the Congress warning against it, it was too high a price to pay, and so the ban was dropped. But this idea, this broader fear that there would be a violent Arab reaction, something that we hear a lot about, of course, in our own time. In fact, today we talk about jihad. We use the, word, the term and the phenomenon of jihad a lot, and it's not always realized that even back then, there was talk of jihad. Uh, and this, in fact, this fear of jihad, fear of provoking a jihad, was actually a major factor in Roosevelt's calculations regarding Palestine during World War II. And just for example, at the infamous Bermuda Refugee Conference in 1943, um, the instructions given to the American delegation that went to Bermuda was that they should not raise the issue of settling refugees in North Africa, that that would be extremely unwise, in the President's words, because of possible Arab reaction. The President met in the spring of 1944 with both Rabbi Wise and Rabbi Silver, <clears throat> who at that time, this is the spring of 44, six months before the episode that we, I just described, uh, and they were pressing him at that point to consider issuing a pro-Zionist statement. And he specifically said to them, I'm quoting here, this is from Wise's own account, do you want to be responsible by such action for the loss of hundreds of thousands of lives? Do you want to start a holy jihad? The president argued that if the United States, if the president supported Zionism, <clears throat> that there would be this violent Arab reaction and that American GIs would be killed uh, throughout the Middle East. <clears throat> And I want to just add here an interesting comment on this argument, made many years later by Golda Meir in her biography in 1975. She addressed this, this argument that this fear of provoking jihad. Here's what she wrote. She said, what would have happened if the Allies had firmly supported Zionism and rescue? A few Arab leaders might have made threatening speeches Perhaps there would have been a protest march or two. Maybe there would even have been an additional act of pro-Nazi sabotage somewhere in the Middle East. But thousands more of the six million might have survived. Thousands more of the ghetto fighters and the Jewish partisans might have been armed. And the civilized world might then have been freed of the terrible accusation that not a finger was lifted to help the Jews in their torment. I want to conclude with a comment on a remark made by Nahum Goldman in those, at that Jewish agency session to which I referred earlier. 
As I say, he was explaining to Ben-Gurion and the other leaders of the Palestine Jewish community the political situation in Washington, the attitudes of the president and his administration toward Palestine and Zionism and the plight of European Jewry. And when they asked him what he thought of President Roosevelt, was President Roosevelt a friend deep down? Was he a friend of the Jews, of, of the Zionist idea? Goldman said that Roosevelt could be described as a Yedid Shetachi, a superficial friend, kind of a fair weather friend, I would, that would be my translation. He was a friend when there was no, little or no political cost, as in 1936, with pressuring Baldwin to keep the doors open. Or in 1944, when there was tremendous pressure from Congress and Jewish activists and the Treasury Department to help refugees, so he established the War Refugee Board because there was a price to be paid. There was a scandal brewing. His administration would have been exposed for abandoning the refugees. And so when there was pressure, then he was willing to make a gesture. But, but when there was no political cost, uh, but, but when there was a political cost, such, such as, let's say, that we talked about the white paper. He didn't want to aggravate the British. That was too high a political price to pay, so he did nothing. He was willing to ban public discussion of Palestine until the pressure became too serious. David Niles, who was one of Roosevelt's closest Jewish advisors, he was his liaison to the Jewish community and other ethnic communities. Niles was probably correct when he said much later that if Roosevelt had lived until 1948, if he had been president in 1948, that he probably would not have supported the creation of the State of Israel. When it came to the question of Jewish immigration to the United States, there it was not just a, political, a question of political cost or of international relations. There we go back to his personal view. We saw from the earlier statements that I cited that FDR's personal vision of how America should look was an America without too many foreigners, without too many Jews or too many Asians, <clears throat> without too many of them concentrating and dominating and influencing. So there his personal views came to the fore. There was not just a matter of political or diplomatic considerations. In the mind of President Franklin Roosevelt, the Jewish question, as, as he called it, was really quite a nuisance. Jews and Zionism always seemed to be causing problems. They always seemed to be creating political and diplomatic difficulties for him, headaches. But what ultimately, what ultimately were Jewish leaders asking him for? When Rabbi Wise or Rabbi Silver or others went to the White House, and when they asked Roosevelt to intervene on various issues, what, were they really asking for so much? They were never asking the US government to risk America's interests. They weren't, and they were not asking him to take political risks. When we talked about the quotas, they weren't asking him to change the whole quota system. That would be a political risk. That would be a political cost. They were asking him just allow the existing quotas to be filled. They knew at that time that immigration was being suppressed below what the law allowed. So they weren't asking him to do so much. They weren't asking for half the kingdom to cite the book of Esther. <clears throat> when Jewish leaders asked the Allies to provide ships to bring Jewish refugees out of Nazi Europe, they weren't asking him to take ships away from battle zones. They weren't asking to divert from the war effort. They never would have asked for that. They asked him to use empty ships that were coming back from Europe. These were known as liberty ships. They would bring American troops and war material to Europe, and then they would return empty. In fact, the problem of coming back empty required the ships to be loaded with ballast, with 
typically large chunks of concrete, to weigh them down so they wouldn't capsize. There is an entire section um, of Lower Manhattan, entire area of, the, of a bay there, uh, Lower Manhattan, called Bristol Bay. And if you're ever in the area, go look at, at Bristol Bay. There's a little plaque explaining why it's called Bristol Bay. Because the city of Bristol in England was so badly damaged by German bombings during the war that there were enormous amounts of rubble. So it was from Bristol, very frequently, that these ships, that American Liberty ships, would load up with chunks of concrete and, and bring that, bring that uh, cargo back to the US. And then it was dumped in the water there by the southeastern uh, section of Manhattan. <clears throat> At a certain point, somebody in the mayor's office realized that instead of just dumping all this concrete in the water, uh, that maybe they could do something with it. Now, let me just mention here, while this was going on, while they're bringing all this concrete, a few Jewish leaders heard about it. And so, for example, in the publications of the Jewish activist, the Bergson Group, around this time there's an editorial arguing that if they're bringing back concrete as ballast, they could be using human beings as ballast. Why not load Jews onto those ships if you've got to weigh them down so they don't capsize? Well, anyway, of course, such arguments were ignored. They weren't made only by the Bergson Group, by the way. I'm just mentioning that as an example. Um, because the Bergson Group specifically caught wind of the mayor's plan, the mayor of New York's plan, to use the concrete for something else. They decided they could take all that unused rubble and use it to help pave a new highway that was then under construction on the east side of Manhattan. So the rubble that was brought to America instead of the Jews, because Roosevelt did not want more Jews in America, was used to help build what we know today as the FDR Drive. My point, though, is that Jews, in asking for the use of empty ships, were not asking for the world. They were saying the ship's already empty. And the same applies to the question of the Roosevelt administration's rejection of requests to bomb Auschwitz. The administration responded to requests for such bombing by saying, and we have their letters saying this, that planes would have to be diverted from the battle zones, diverted from the war effort, in order to go into Poland and bomb those camps or the railway tracks leading to them. But we know, in fact, that that was a lie, that American and British planes flew right over Auschwitz during that period. They didn't have to be diverted. In fact, they were bombing targets within the Auschwitz complex. They were hitting the oil factories and munitions factories where Jewish slave laborers from Auschwitz were, were taken each day. So the planes were right there. When Jewish leaders asked for planes to bomb Auschwitz, they weren't asking for planes to be diverted. They were already there. And one might say also, something of the same applies to the question of Jewish statehood in Palestine. They weren't necessarily asking for a Jewish state to be created immediately. They didn't expect it to be done overnight. What they were saying was, just leave the doors open now so that the Jews who are fleeing for their lives have some place to go. And don't send them back. Don't send British patrols into the Mediterranean to stop these ref refugees who are trying to escape and send them back to Hitler Europe. And that really is the, the ultimate, and the most important point here, that the truth is that the Jews were really asking for very little. They were asking for the leftovers. But even that, it seems, was too much to ask. Thank you. Yeah, you should. Okay, thanks uh, to Dr. Bedoff for that presentation. We're going to be hearing about all of that information and all of those themes as we go through the conference. We are willing to take some questions. Uh, we'll keep it to about 10 minutes because uh, I'm sure that a number of you are tired, but let's, let's take questions. I'll just call on people. Stand up, please. <laughs>
and give us your question. Anybody? Yes, sir. Okay, I'll just, let me just repeat the questions for those who may be sitting too far away to have heard. Um, the question, as I understand it, is that the implementation of the, of the mass murder um, distracted the Germans to some extent, is that what you're saying, from the, from the German war effort, and therefore what? What's your point? Therefore... Okay. If the the question is, if the Allies bombed the rail the railway lines to Auschwitz, and the trains therefore were not being used to deport the Jews, those trains would be used for the war effort. Whether it's actually or not. It's well, this of course this is all just speculation, obviously at this point. But but the period okay, but the period you're talking about though, the period when the bombing requests were made and rejected was very late in the war. It was in the spring and summer and, and fall of 1944. Um, so I think, without going into a lot of detail, I think it's fair to say that at that point, um, the German war effort was already well on the way to defeat. And having some additional cattle cars, it's hard to imagine how that would have made any significant a difference in the war effort. And, you know, if you're arguing about 1942, that's a different discussion. But you're talking about, you know, within months of the end of the war, it's hard to see how having a small number of additional train cars would have made a real difference. Yes, sir. I have two questions related to pre-war, so the 1930s, U.S. foreign policy. Well documented, the United States was, the FDR was a reflective popular opinion of isolation. To what extent was it appreciated that Hitler would be more than just staying in place in Germany, that you know, he would eventually want to take over other, occupy other places, and this would become a bigger issue I, you know, I, if, if you don't mind, I would prefer you limit yourself to one question because there are a lot of hands up and a lot of people. I, I think you should choose one of your two. Could you choose one of your two questions, though? What was the role of the Jewish community in that public opinion? What do you mean in that public opinion? What was the view of the Jewish community in America of, iso of U.S. isolation prior ah. to the war? Okay. Um, so you're asking, first of all, really about American government perceptions of the potential for German aggression. And then you're asking about Amer the American Jewish community's um, view of the isolationist sentiment in America. Okay, either of those topics, we could have a whole four days on either one, right? So again, I'm asking you, which one do you want me to address, just in fairness to other questioners? American government or American Jewry? I'm, I'm asking you to choose. Okay. Well, we'll say, I'll, I'll just say this, I'll just say this. Um, Franklin Roosevelt had no illusions about the likelihood of German aggression and German expansionism. He was not naive. Um, and, I, and I'll share with you an interesting anecdote uh, that Roosevelt shared at a press conference in 1934. Okay, 34 is very early. Um, he said he had heard from a, um, a tourist in Germany who had been visiting with a German family. This tourist had described to FDR how their eight-year-old son, every night when he went to bed, would say a prayer hoping to die with a French bullet in his heart. So Roosevelt said, we know that the German nation is being prepared for war, and even German children are being educated to view France, in this case, as the enemy and as, as a country with which they would soon be clashing. So I would say, the president had no illusions about the likelihood of, uh, of, of some um, German expansionism, let's call it. Of course, the, you know, the details of it became more clear as the years went on. But even that early in 1934, certainly FDR had a sense that Germany was already girding for war.
Wait, wait, are you leading up to a question here? Okay, I, I'm not, I, haven't, I don't remember seeing anything in the Casablanca transcripts indicating that the president was aware of the role of North African Jews in assisting the allies. I'm not sure if he was even specifically aware of it. I have not seen any comments by him about that. Okay, I don't, again, I don't recall anything specific from the, from the Casablanca transcripts. Okay, we're just going to take two more. Um, please I, keep it to a question. Which guys? I mean, anybody? Yeah, you've written a lot about the service improvement. We owe you a great debt for bringing their activity to the knowledge of the Jewish and federal world. I wonder if you could comment on the connection with the theme of Roosevelt and his attitude towards Jews and Zionism about the march of the rabbis, which took place in Washington, his refusal to meet with them. A meeting with the President of the United States is a great honor. So someone whom the President agrees to meet, <clears throat> the President is in effect conferring a certain legitimacy on that person and on that person's, let's say, their, their political request. <clears throat> so when the rabbis who led the march to the White House in 1943 requested that five of their representatives meet with the President, there was, in the, in the minds of the president and his advisors, a political cost. Okay, so now I'm going back to the theme of my earlier remarks. <clears throat> the political cost was this. The president met with these rabbis. He would be giving attention and respectability to their request. And their request was that he create a new government agency to rescue Jewish refugees. And so ultimately, <clears throat> the president's decision not to meet with the rabbis, a decision which was also supported and encouraged by his Jewish advisors, was a political calculation. He didn't want to give them the time of day because that would give more stature to their positions, and he did not want to create a government agency to rescue Jewish refugees. In this case, the interesting, um, the interesting thing that happened is that it backfired. He snubbed the rabbis because he didn't want to give them attention, but the headlines in the next day's newspapers in Washington or about the president snubbing the rabbis. Um, it, it, what happened is that reporters asked some of the rabbis who had just heard the news that the president wouldn't meet them, asked them what they thought, and, um, and they expressed great disappointment that the president would not meet them. And there's a famous, uh, famous, there's a well-known, a column was written in one of the Yiddish newspapers a few days later where the columnist asked if 500 Catholic priests and nuns had marched to the White House, can we imagine the president would have refused to meet them? So there was that kind of anger, that kind of bitterness, let's say. Um, so the rabbis who were asked this question about how they felt about the president not meeting them expressed great disappointment. And this is something that was not done in America in 1943. American Jews did not publicly express disappointment with President Roosevelt. And so it was, so that, the very fact that you had um, this turn of this, you know, this turnabout, uh, a prominent rabbi saying such a thing, that became literally a front page story in the Washington Times Herald. So, again, the irony is the story that FDR and his advisors hoped they could bury by not meeting the rabbis and by taking the president out the White House literally through a rear exit um, at a time in the afternoon when he had no other appointments, as we know from his daily appointment book. Instead, it ended up giving more publicity and attention to the march and to the demands of the march. I can't go into the whole story now about the creation of the War Refugee Board. It is not correct to say that the march led to the creation of the War Refugee Board. It is correct to say that the march was part of a series of public protests which helped generate pressure, which in turn was one of the factors that ultimately helped bring about the creation of the board. I'm sure we'll talk about it more during the conference. Okay, let's do one more and then we'll adjourn, but uh, Dr. Medoff, we'll give you 
I think it's important to be careful here. They weren't killed by the allies. They didn't let them in. Okay. Let, 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 me, let me finish. Um, they, were, they were murdered by the Germans and, by the, by the, and the Germans' collaborators. There are two separate stories here. They're intertwined, but they're two separate stories. There's a story of mass murder, and then there's a story of what might have been, a story of abandonment. But that's not, it's not quite the same. Now, um, and, and, and here's an interesting, I'll give you an illustration of the, of this, of the situation um, and of the numbers that you're, you're referring to. <clears throat> the one attempt that was made in Congress prior to World War II to bring in more Jewish refugees outside the quota system was the Wagner-Rogers Bill of 1939. This was a bill that would have permitted 20,000 German children, it would have been German Jewish children, to come to America outside the regular quotas. It was in the wake of Kristallnacht, so there was an outpouring of public sympathy for the Jews. <clears throat> but this was a way of trying to help Jewish refugees without getting into the thorny problem of the accusation that refugees will take away jobs from American citizens. The argument of the bill's supporters was if we bring in children, they'll be under 16, and there's no danger to anybody's job. So they, they were trying to anticipate and, um, and undermine arguments against letting in 20,000 kids. Okay. Incidentally, had the bill passed among the children who, in theory, would have qualified to immigrate to America were Anne Frank and her sister Margot, because they were under 16 and were, of course, of German nationality. Um, the opposition to the bill um, was most brutally typified by uh, a cousin, a first cousin of President Roosevelt, Laura Delano Howdley, who also was the wife of the U.S. Commissioner of Immigration. She made a remark at a private dinner party in Washington, which really sums up why there was so much opposition, even just to bring in children who would not take away jobs. In this dinner party, she commented, that 20,000 charming children would all too soon grow up into 20,000 ugly adults. Now, how do we know that she said that? Well, um, no, let me step back. I quoted that remark in an article that I wrote a few years back. Um, and lo and behold, one day I get an email from a gentleman named Howdling who says he came across my article on the internet and he's furious. He said, he said to me, he is Laura Delano Howling's grandson and he knew his grandmother personally. And he said, she didn't have an anti-Semitic bone in her body. He can't believe that grandma would have said such a thing. Dr. Medoff, how can you be slandering my grandmother's good name? What is he, you think I just made, it, made that quote up? I wrote back and I said, what do you think? I just made that quote up? Um, by the way, on four, he, he CC on his email to me, like charging me with slander and outrage. He CC'd about 50 of his relatives. So I'm already thinking, oh my God, like a, a mob of angry howdlings with pitchforks and, and, and torches are gonna be on my front lawn any day. Um, I wrote back and I said, I, look, I didn't, I didn't you know, just conjure up this quote. It was found by a historian of, of considerable repute, Professor Henry Feingold. Um, and here's the library where he found it which was at um, uh, the Wiener Library in, uh, at Harvard. <clears throat> and what Professor Feingold was looking at was a diary of a State Department official named Pierre Pont Moffat. And Pierre Pont Moffat had been sitting next to Laura Houdling at the dinner, and she made the remark, and he thought it was so interesting that when he went home that night, he wrote it in his diary. Oh, there was another diary. See, it's, it's really good people in those days kept diaries, right? So he wrote just because he thought it was curious. It was a private diary 
He would never publish it. He never intended to embarrass Mrs. Howdling. He just thought, oh, that's an interesting remark, kind of sums up why a lot of people are against allowing these children in. Okay. So I said, that's where I got the statement. That's what I quoted from. I said, if you want, go to the library. You can look, you can look it up. And lo and behold, about, I don't know, a month or two later, I get a kind of a sheepish email back from young Howdling. He says, well, I went to the library, and I looked it up, and I read the diary entry, and I see that, apparently, Grandma really did say that. And I'm ashamed, and it's hard to believe. Um, but apparently, those were his words. And fortunately, he cc'd all the relatives again, so got them all off my back. <laughs> the bitter irony here, though, is that less than a year later, when the, Brit when the German blitz of England began, several thousand British children were brought to America. The president rushed through Congress with overwhelming congressional support, legislation to allow them to come to the United States. Um, and they were, and, they, and their lives were saved. But for Jewish children, unfortunately, there was a different standard. Thank you.